So uh, thanks for tuning in. This is a this is going to be basically just uh, emperors, weird emperors and weird kings that I don't normally get to uh, uh, talk a lot about. Um, actually, real quick, how do I spotlight me? There we go. All right, hooray. Um, so yeah, I'm, this is I in all of my princess stuff. I didn't. I would do a lot of research and end up only being able to cover women uh, in this because it's not really rejected princes. It's like uh, you know. So I had a lot of people that I'd run across that I never get to actually talk about because uh, they weren't under the purview of the project that I'm excited to be able to talk to you about uh, today. So I'm gonna start doing virtual background stuff. Uh, most all these people are. Um, how to put it. They're really peculiar. Most of them have varying degrees of uh, mental health problems uh, that manifest in various, mostly hy hysterical ways. Sometimes it's a, it's a little sad. So it's going to be a little bit of mixture of all of them. But there's, there was one guy that was kind of on the cusps, cusp, so I'm going to start a little early and talk about him. Jason, uh, did you remember to turn on your record? I'm sorry? Did you turn on record? I think I already did. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's recording. Uh, so the first guy that was, was honestly, I was probably going to cut, but I, I still made time for him anyways, um, is uh, actually the emperor of Japan between two really important emperors. So the, you had Emperor Meiji on one end, who was like uh, in the 1800s, uh, the Meiji Jingu Shrine, if you've been to Tokyo uh, over in um, by Harajuku, it's a, a big park area. Uh, is named after him. It was sort of the the emperor that saw Japan stopping an isolationist country and like like you know uh, had the, the sort of last of the samurai wars. Uh, and then after Yoshihito, the, the, the emperor I'm going to talk about was uh, the emperor who uh, Hirohito, who brought them through World War II. But in between, they had a, a kind of brief period of uh, I think about ten years. Uh, where you had this guy, uh, Yoshihito. Yoshihito is, is not well known. Uh, he was uh, partially because he was tremendously sickly. Uh, dude had childhood meningitis, had lead poisoning as a kid, uh, became emperor in 1912, and just was never really seen a whole lot. And everybody was kind of like, uh, sort of viewed him as a, a ceremonial figurehead. Probably he is best known for uh, the opening of the uh, the 1913 Diet, the, that being the uh, Japan's basically their their Congress, uh, and keep in mind that this is an era of Japan where they literally thought the emperor that was like a a god king that was descended from Amaterasu, so they would greet the the uh, emperor with like uh, utter reverence. They would like so he he shows up at the the inauguration of the Diet, and everybody sort of stands like you know at attention. And he, being somewhat sickly, um, takes his speech, rolls it up, and just looks at everybody, like through a spyglass. Apparently, he does this for upwards of 10 minutes and never actually delivers a speech before he's sort of ushered off screen. But there's the, the story goes that everybody sort of stood at attention for those 10 minutes while he was looking at them through his rolled up uh, speech, which I think is, is a hilarious visual, but also like poor guy. Um, he did end up uh, having uh, several kids, uh, very, very rarely seen in public, and uh, his kids, uh, you know, went on to uh, govern Japan through World War II, so um, it worked out. Anyways, um, the other folks I'm going to talk about I can tell you much, much more about um, and are, are far more fleshed out, uh, interesting, wonderful characters. Um, the first one of which I think gets almost no love historically, very, very few people talk about this guy. Um, and it's Friedrich Wilhelm I of Prussia. Yeah, uh, everybody's favorite uh, Prussian guy. He's technically not an emperor, he's a king. Uh, he's known as the soldier king. Um, and he was just a weird, weird dude. Uh, he was uh, very uptight about finances, very particular about kind of how the country was to be run, really into parades, really into drilling people for reality. Uh, the thing he's probably best known for is uh, a legion that he called the Potsdam Giants. Um, he was super into really tall dudes. 
And so other countries would actually have diplomacy with Prussia and bribe him with like their tallest guys. They would just send over their tall, tall children. And he arranged them into this grenade year legion that was never actually sent into battle, uh, that he would just drill every morning as like a thing to do. He really like loved these super tall guys. Dude was five three. So, and like everybody there was like six three or above. Uh, many of them had gigantism. Like a lot of them were, were like, would have been terrible in a war anyways and tr tremendous health problems but he just loved these guys he would parade them through uh his bedroom when he was depressed and paint them uh, a couple of the paintings still survive um unfortunately a lot of these potsdam giants were, were really quite depressed and like had kind of terrible lives but uh the country kind of loved them and they uh ended up ha like uh continuing on to present day like that's that's an actual picture that you can go and find online stock picture like these guys are still around and have these crazy outfits w weren't crazy at the time but are, are kind of interesting now um but yeah frederick wilhelm the first uh beyond being really into tall dudes uh was also super into a work ethic uh, he'd walk around with a cane beating people while yelling prussia needs you now uh just on the streets everywhere um, if a minister spent more than an hour on a sermon on, on Sundays, uh, he was fined. Uh, and uh, if he spent, like, he did it regularly, they would fire the minister and, like, get another one. Uh, a famous anecdote uh, was that uh, uh, Frederick Wilhelm first was, was wandering around the streets, uh, looking at people, and, and, like, a peasant saw him and, like, crossed the street and started going the other direction. And not one to be disrespected, Frederick Wilhelm chased him down and asked him why he'd run. And the terrified peasant answered, because I'm afraid of you. At which point, Frederick Wilhelm beat the dude senseless with his cane while shouting, you should love me, um, which is basically vintage Frederick Wilhelm. Um, he was frugal beyond measure. Uh, he sold the uh, empire's yacht. He fired all the court musicians. He was just not into pomp or circumstance, uh, except when it came to tall men and grenade or legions in his bedroom. Um, if a woman dressed too outrageously or out extravagantly, uh, he would berate her. And on one occasion, they said to have actually uh, uh, ripped up someone's dress while they were wearing it. Um, he wrote a manual for every single civil servant position in Prussia, like all of them. Like the dude was like king of middle management. Um, and a, more than a little crazy, he would fly into a rage at the merest mention of France. He just hated France, which is something that he passed on to his poor child, uh, Fritz. Uh, this is Fritz, uh, after he grew up. Uh, there are, I think, tellingly no, no portraits of this guy younger than this. Like, this is sort of how history has preserved him, as this, like, bugged out guy who, like, looks permanently shell-shocked. Like, every single painting of him has him with these like super bugged out eyes. Um, he got it real bad. Uh, so Fritz wanted to grow up and be a poet. Fritz was a gentle soul. He was really into to flutes. Um, he just wanted to be a musician, uh, which his dad strictly forbid. Uh, he's like, you're going to be a military man just like your dad. Mind you, his dad, Frederick Wilhelm, never actually like waged a war. He was far too frugal for that. Wars cost money, but he was a very military man. And like by the end of his life, like, you know, about 10% of all of Prussian men were part of the military. And he was very into the military. He never actually waged war, but he wanted his son to be able to do so. So uh, he had the soldier king was like, all right, young Fritz, uh, I'm going to be training you on the, all this stuff, even though you want to play the flute, which he did in secret. Um, so he would, at starting at like the age of, of four or five, he woke up poor Fritz every morning with a cannon outside his window. He would just fire a cannon as like a wake up sound. Uh, and he, uh, <laughs> uh, at age six, gave Fritz a, a legion of six year olds to command uh, like in battle or just to, to drill every morning. Uh, and the poor guy actually tried escaping to England with his uh, tutor. Uh, who he probably had a, a, a gay relationship with. Uh, his dad, uh, who was not really dad of the year here, uh, caught them, brought them back, and beheaded the tutor in front of him. Um, and so, yeah, this did not do real well by his son, but his son did actually grow up to become an amazing strategist, led the country very victoriously in a bunch of wars, and is generally known to history as Frederick the Great. 
Um, if y'all have not seen, uh, as an aside, where I got that uh, still from, um, Epic Rap Battles of History, it's a YouTube uh, series where it's various uh, uh, people in history and, and pop culture sort of rapping against each other. Um, they do a really pretty amazing job, and they've got one uh, that I took this, this from that is um, Ivan the Great versus, uh, Ivan the Terrible versus uh, Alexander the Great, Frederick the Great, Catherine the Great, and uh, Pompey the Great which is a deep cut, <laughs> I appreciate. Uh, it makes basically a cameo, but they do a great job. They even like uh, get in there, if you, you see this, uh, he's playing the flute when he pops up and they actually make it part of it because he loved playing the flute. Um, and they, they have uh, great lyrics in there. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, it talks about, uh, he's got creative talents and battle malice. Uh, his uh, uh, oblique uh, tactic, military tactics ain't exactly straight. Like, it's a lot of like like throwaway lines, but like they did their research. I actually really love this series. Uh, not all their stuff is is fabulous, but like, man, I really love that one. Anyways, um, so Frederick the Great actually did a great job, despite being a a, a very traumatized uh, youth uh, again with super bugged out eyes all the time, uh, and introduced uh, potatoes to Germany. And weirdly enough, that's kind of what he's known for posthumously. He's been known for a lot of things, but. Uh, to this day, he didn't want to be uh, buried next to his wife. He wanted to be buried next to his greyhounds, and he was. And people visit his grave to this day and like drop potatoes on it. Uh, like, he was just like super into potatoes. He would have like uh, uh, state dinners and like smack his lips and wanted everybody to be as into potatoes as he was. Um, yeah, so that's Frederick Wilhelm I, uh, his, his crazy dad, and uh, Frederick the Great, uh, some of my, my favorite weirdos of, uh, of history. Um, moving right along, because um, this is about uh, wacky, uh, this, these guys were kings, but kind of behaved as emperors, uh, but I, I said that this is about wacky emperors. You can probably guess who the next person I'm going to talk about is, because um, for my money, uh, a city is basically defined, like what makes a city really great in my mind is its eccentrics, its weirdos. Like LA has Angeline and, and the Venice Beach tree man. And uh, SF Modern Day has uh, Frank Chu, who is a, a very strange man. Um, but old school SF had the king of all eccentrics, or the emperor of all eccentrics, Emperor Joshua Norton I, the uh, emperor of the United States of America and protector of Mexico. Um, this is a guy who, who lived in uh, the 1800s uh, in, in San Francisco. Uh, he'd wander around the uh, streets in uh, this uh, awesome uh, regalia. And he'd issued decrees, he printed his own money, basically declared himself emperor of the, the United States and everybody kind of went along with it, which is amazing. Uh, in 1859, he walks into the San Francisco Evening Bulletin and declares, this is a quote, at the peremptory request and desire of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, I, Joshua Norton, declare and proclaim myself emperor of these United States. And the people running this newspaper were just like, yeah, all right, and ran with it. They just printed it. And then by the next year, he uh, declared himself also protector of Mexico for a while. He, he gave that up after a, a couple of years because he decided that was too difficult. You know, Mexico was untamed land, he said. Um, and he would just like wander around in like this, this outfit that actually uh, got better as time progressed. Like initially it was, it was like this sort of ratty outfit. Uh, then he got uh, a, a little bit better. He got like canes donated to him. And then uh, like a couple of years in, he was walking around with this saber and this peacock feather and like, he was looking pretty sharp. Um, I really want to be this guy for Halloween, but uh, he also looks like a, a civil war general and that's just, it's a bad look. <laughs> um, but he'd go to pu public gatherings of all kinds and make pu proclamations. Like this guy would just show up at the theater, at operas, he'd go to people's weddings, funerals, and he somehow never really wore out his welcome. He was very tactful. He was a very polite man, like despite being like, a kind of crazy he was just like very well spoken and people loved having him around he would pop in just enough for people to like yay it's a cameo from this guy he'd maybe give a speech and they'd wander off um and he was he actually his heart was like in in the right place he had a lot of really like surprise like good ideas like uh there were a bunch of anti-chinese riots and he literally would get in front of the the, the rioters and like get down on his knees and like start reciting the lord's prayer which confused them and also this guy's like an emperor we're not really sure and it would break up riots that way like this is in the, like 1850s 1860s so he's like 
dude was a, a, a kind-hearted guy. Like nobody had like a really a bad uh, thing to say about him. He also was uh, the first person on record that uh, at least historically that we can tell to propose uh, the Bay Bridge in an under the Bay tunnel. Like he had a lot of like ahead of their time ideas. He came up with all the like a, a proposal for uh, safety stuff for the, um, uh, the trolleys that were going around. He's like, oh, that's a great idea, but you need to have like emergency brakes in place and here's how I think it should go. I, dude was ahead of his time. Um, <laughs> so he, he paid for things with, like I said, his, his own imperial notes, uh, his, uh, and these are still like around places. Like they occasionally pop up on eBay. Uh, he just printed a ton of them. I, to this day, I tried looking this up, could not figure out where the hell he was printing them. Cause they look really pretty good. Like they got like, like a woodcut of him, right? And it's like, he had several different versions of these over the years. And he would go and he, they were basically like bonds that he would sell and people would legit pay for that. He get to, uh, he would go into uh, places and like, like he'd, he'd go into a bar and levy a, a tax. He'd just like walk in and just like, I'm here to collect a tax for $1 million, but I may be bribed with cigars and brandy. And they'd do it. They just like, people just, rallied around him when he his uh uniform got too ratty and they'd get him a new one like the the guy who was a uh, head of the military at the presidio actually like got him like a a, a new emperor's outfit when he, uh, his old one was uh wear worn down there's uh records of people giving him hats a walking stick umbrellas um there's also records of people who were not on board with uh, the emperor norton train and tried to get him um well sent to a, a sanitarium uh, there's, there's a record of a judge dismissing uh, a suit brought against him saying that Norton was quote, just about in, uh, the thing go just about the best thing going in the King line. Like he's the best King out there, uh, which is true. Uh, he ate and spent, uh, ate and drank free at, uh, the best restaurants and saloons, broke, uh, spoke at, uh, political rallies and, uh, no theater in town reportedly would open without, uh, reserving a seat for him and his two dogs, uh, Bummer and Lazarus. So, uh, I'm gonna put a pin in this. I'm gonna tell you the legends and then uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about where this all like comes uh, apart. So uh, he was often sort of associated with these two dogs who were also kind of um, interesting uh, people who are uh, figures about town in, uh, in SF at the time. They were just these two uh, vagrant dogs uh, that were so popular that after Bummer's death, which uh, also got its own like thing in the paper, uh, he was given a eulogy by Mark Twain, of all people, which uh, my favorite line out of it is, uh, he died full of years and honor and disease and fleas, which is kind of vintage Twain. Um, and you can still see their, uh, uh, there's memorials for them uh, hanging around uh, SF, uh, despite them just literally being two random dogs that were just on the street that people took a liking to. Um, but yeah, like he, state legislature apparently gave uh, Emperor Norton a chair, uh, the, uh, an upholstered chair when the Emperor of Brazil visited. There's some record of SF presenting Emperor Norton uh, to, to the Emperor of Brazil, which is a weird move diplomatically. Uh, I think we can all agree. But all of this is like getting into like legend and hearsay and like stuff that was printed in the papers. And sadly, we can't take a lot of that at face value. Um, what we do know about this guy is his actual story. And by the end of his life, people were so confused as to whether this guy was actually an emperor or like a, a, a crazy dude that when he died, they, they, they went into his house and like thought, oh, maybe he is really rich. He wasn't. Um, his story was that he was, he was a, a dude from England. Uh, he was a Jew, one of the tribe, one of us, one of us, um, who did okay for a while. He came out as a prospector in uh, the early, like early, I think 1849, 1850, somewhere in there. Um, who then kind of lost it all. Uh, he, did, he did pretty well. There was a big fire in, in uh, SF in 1851, and uh, his storehouses weren't hit, so he did pretty well. And then he lost it all when he uh, bet real big on, on trying to corner the market on rice, and then a bunch of rice came in, and he basically lost all his money. Um, and then he kind of disappears for, from the circle record for about a decade and pops back up in 1859 when he walks into uh, the newspaper offices and declares himself the emperor of the United States. So what happened in the intervening years, we're not sure, but uh, it's not hard to guess based off of like his proclamations of which many were printed in the paper, uh, where his head was at. Because this was like, 
he was declaring himself emperor right before Lincoln was uh, uh, elected. Uh, suffice to say, the mood in, in the States was tense. It was on the, the cusp of the Civil War. Um, and he was far from the only guy who was getting these, these admiral outfits. Like everybody was getting these outfits because they, they knew a war was coming. Um, so he probably did all this honestly to try and bring people together. Uh, like you can actually see in some of his, his proclamations is the idea behind it is like, uh, here's a quote, they should dissolve the Republican form of government and establish in its stead an absolute monarchy. Like he was just worried that people were going to fight against each other. He would literally like, like I said, get in the middle of, of like anti-Chinese riots. He just didn't want people to kill each other. Yes, he was a bit eccentric, but his heart's in the right place. Um, but the SF newspapers uh, just had a field day with him and they printed a bunch of stuff, much of which they just put words in his mouth. Uh, he, I, I mentioned earlier is his dogs, Bummer and Lazarus. Um, those weren't his dogs. Those were just random dogs that he was associated with, that he hated that association because Bummer was basically a, a per, uh, derogatory word for homeless people at the time. So he was often referred to as the third Bummer. Uh, and he hated that. Uh, he wanted to be treated with dignity, and most people did, but some people didn't. Um, but by the end of his life, uh, he was actually well-beloved kind of everywhere, and when he died, it actually made national news. This is a, a newspaper clipping from Chicago uh, of people, like, they're, they're, again, like, putting it sort of straight-laced of, like, yeah, no, he was the, the emperor of, they're, they're having it as a emperor of California and Mexico, but uh, he had actually proclaimed himself the emperor of the United States, so maybe Chicago wasn't on board with all of it, but um yeah there's uh, it's it's really hard to to disentangle like what what's true and what's not about him um there's a lot of different places that came forward saying that oh yeah we let him eat here for free and not a lot of record of him actually eating there for free um so he's he became like more a, a character of myth uh, this caricature than an actual human being um which also kind of suited him fine and he's shown up in a lot of other stuff since. Uh, I think uh, notably uh, Neil Gaiman's Sandman uh, shows up near the end uh, where uh, Death, uh, uh, Sandman, uh, uh, Dream's sister, proclaims that uh, she likes him best of, of all emperors. Uh, and she's got good taste. Um, yeah, he uh, had a massive funeral uh, when, when he died. Uh, according to some records, there was a, a uh, eclipse uh, when he died, which I didn't actually bother going and looking up. I kind of doubt that's the case, but, um, yeah, the, the, it is, it is verifiable that like lots of people showed up to, uh, the, the mortuary where he's being held and then his funeral. And then weirdly enough, uh, he died in 1880. He had another funeral in 1954 when, uh, SF sort of changed up some of the, uh, rules around town they basically there's not cemeteries inside of sf so they moved him to uh one outside where his body remains to this day in uh, woodlawn cemetery in uh, colma um but yeah i think generally uh, everybody's favorite emperor uh emperor norton was 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 my buddy i like him um all right the last emperor i have for you this is a a real weird one that's going to be a lot of like tripping tripping over pronouns tripping over like what's true and what's not uh this is elagabalus um the roman emperor uh lived in the, the 200s uh very, even even knowing what to call this person like what name to call this person is a little tricky um popularly uh they're called elagabalus or heliogabalus um that is not technically their name. Uh, that is technically, well, I'll, I'll get into it in a bit, uh, but is the name that they, they got popularized as. Uh, there's a quote actually on their, their, their Wikipedia page from a historian, which I love, that'll give you an idea of, of what you're about to dive into. Uh, the name Elagabalus is branded in history above all others because of his unspeakably disgusting life. Um, so Elagabalus is basically real life hedonism bot, um, so if you've ever watched uh, Futurama, that's, that's all of those ideas basically are summed up in this one, one person. Um, you got orgies, you got suicide towers, you got ridiculous animals being let loose on the public, uh, just every, every kind of excess you could possibly imagine. Problem is that most all of it is, is almost certainly false, but they're amazing, weird propaganda that I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to lead you through. 
problematizing this somewhat significantly uh, is the fact that in, in the past couple years, really the past like 10, 20 years, uh, Elagabalus has been uh, kind of lionized as a, a gay slash trans icon, um, which is largely levied off of some of the stuff that people were saying about this person in order to, to smear them. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a weird thing. Like I, on the one hand, the stuff that the, the ancient world was trying to smear Elagabalus with, I'm fully in favor of, of just normalizing and like, no, that's, that's amazing. I think that even if this didn't happen, that's really funny. And like, there's nothing wrong with that. At the same time, uh, it's, it's kind of like, like modern day fiddlers rallying around Nero. It's, it's a, it's a weird thing of like, okay, yes, like, like, it, it, it's a weird, weird person to, 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 to wrap yourself around. And like so much of, of what's said about this person is, is just, their historiography is a train wreck. It's, it's right up there with uh, like Elizabeth Bathory or, or Empress, Emperor Wu. Uh, Wu Zetian, who I've, I've covered, a uh, female emperor of, of China, who uh, just the, the, the resume reads like an aristocrat's joke. It's, uh, yeah. So um, what this person uh, looked like, uh, this, uh, you can't really see from probably the, uh, the angle of this picture in the uh, Zoom stuff uh, that they have a, a, a sweet stash in there. So it's a, a colorized version of just like sort of a little feathery stash. Uh, You'll note that this person looks pretty young. Uh, it's because they were uh, 14 years old. Um, so here's, here's, I'm gonna start with what we know about this person. Um, it's from Syria, uh, born in Syria. Uh, basically uh, their grandma um, managed to finagle a bunch of stuff uh, whereby Emperor of Rome died and the grandma wanting the fam the, their family to be in a more advantageous position says, oh yeah, no, no, th th this kid over here uh, was actually descended from, was, was actually the child of the late emperor. There was like a, a whole uh, adultery thing that likely wasn't the case, but basically managed to trick everybody into thinking that was the case and got this 14 year old installed uh, through various military coups and whatnot as well uh, as the emperor of Rome. Uh, becomes emperor at age 14. Um, real name is, is Various, and that's probably what this person was called in, in, in life. Um, the Historia Augusta, which is one of the main sources and is an absolute stinky pile of garbage in terms of historical value, but it's really entertaining propaganda. Uh, the Historia Augustus calls it, says that the, the, this person was named Various, quote, uh, because his mother was a harlot and he sprang from the seed of various men which is a hell of a burn. Um, so, right. Uh, Various slash Elagabalus was the head priest of a, uh, a Syrian sun god named Elagabal, or uh, there's a form of, of Baal, uh, who was worshipped as uh, this stone, this, this big black stone. This is actually not terrifically uncommon. You'd have occasional like meteorites and whatnot, even for uh, Aphrodite and Zeus, they, they pop up now and again, but this one was, was more important than, than a lot of the others. So um, Elagabalus uh, the, is, takes, the, the reason they, they call uh, various Elagabalus uh, is because they were associated so strongly with this god and they, they did everything they could to kind of uh, associate themselves more with this god. So when they uh, showed up in uh, Rome, they brought this rock with them and then installed it in the, uh, the various temples as a god above uh, Zeus slash Jupiter and, and all of the, the Roman slash Greek pantheon, uh, which didn't do them a lot of favors, um, you know, popularity wise. Um, so what we know, um, they let their, their mom into the Senate, which was a big scandal. Uh, disbanded the Third Legion after the Third Legion helped put them in power, devalued Roman currency, uh, lavished favors on, on their favorite uh, lovers, uh, including charioteers and kind of lower born folk, which was a scandal. Uh, and I'll, I'll get more into that later. Uh, married a Vestal Virgin, which is uh, definitely like a ra raise an eyebrow kind of moment because um, Vestal Virgins, you may guess from the name, not really supposed to get married and have kids. 
Um, in fact, married five to five different women and multiple different men. The, the, the number is uh, impossible to tell. Um, and would do things like lead uh, the chariot through town uh, backwards while dancing in front of it. And this we, we're, we're pretty sure it happened because you can see in some of the coins, uh, the, uh, the horses there being with the rock. Uh, they, they were just leading a rock around and Elagabalus would get in front of them and just party down through the streets uh, without anybody leading the horses, which is kind of wild. Um, so that's what we can basically confirm. Everything else, here's, here's where we're gonna get into uh, uh, all of his, uh, the weird rumors and uh, basically the, the fabulous version of Elagabalus. Uh, so first off, uh, they make a, a lot, a, there's a lot of stuff in there about uh, Elagabalus' uh, grooming rituals. Uh, they uh, removed all their body hair, uh, said that uh, they, they circumcised themselves, and some, some versions they castrated. It, it's also like, depending on who's translating it, you're going to get different versions of that. Um, said to have uh, disguised themselves as a male prostitute, wandered the streets, had uh, a room in the palace set up as a brothel and would have people come in uh, for that, put on a lot of makeup and wigs, offered money to a physician to uh, give them a vagina, which is where a lot of the trans stuff comes from. Um, again, this, this was meant as like a historical slam on this person and it's really hard to tell whether this is something that is actually the case for this person or just someone making a bunch of stuff up because 90% at least of all the stuff said about Elagabalus is that sort of problematic. So I'm trying to default to they pronouns, uh, but it's, it's just a train wreck. Um, so moving on. Um, ostensibly uh, had spies wandering all the bathhouses in Rome looking for dudes with large penises and then would give them administrative positions based off of their penis size, uh, <laughs> which I think is amazing, uh, would invite old dudes, old senators to dinner and then talk at length for like hours about his uh, sexual conquests or their sexual conquests, um, would, would go to plays that had sex being... Um, performed on stage and then loudly yell, you have to do it for real and make the, the actors actually have sex, like cinema verite. <laughs> um, like, again, all this is, is, is likely false. Uh, we gather every prostitute in the city and lecture them about different sexual positions. Uh, laugh so hard at the theater that no one could hear over their laughter. Had silver urns with pornographic designs all over them like Catherine the Great actually did. Uh, said that they wanted, I uh, already went over the surgeon stuff, um, one of the, the famous ones that actually has been uh, painted a lot, uh, they strew roses all over everything, wouldn't swim anywhere unless it was like perfumed with saffron or something, and once apparently drowned people to death with roses. Uh, if, you, if you look up this person, that's, that's what uh, generally pops up. Um, but yeah, like, it, the list just goes on and on and on. Like, had lions and leopards as pets and would wait until his friends were drunk and then just let in the lions and leopards to, like, for his, his friends to freak out. Uh, would let loose snakes in public gatherings and just laugh about it. Had a ton of ch crazy chariots, including four-horse chariots that he would, like, run around the, the dining room with. I uh, uh, would uh, get pulled around by dogs indoors. Uh, drove a four-person elephant chariot. Uh, and at one point, uh, they said, had uh, uh, themselves naked and were uh, uh, pulled around by various naked women. Uh, so a lot of different chariot-related rumors. Uh, gave out prizes at these various uh, uh, gatherings that I would carve on spoons. So you'd grab a spoon and whatever was on the underside of the spoon was like the prize that you got. Uh, these prizes were insane. Uh, they'd run anything from like 10 pounds of lead to 10 ostriches to a phoenix. Uh, and then in place of actually giving you these things, uh, they would send jars full of frogs or scorpions or snakes. Like crazy shit. Uh, the full account of everything this person did is exhausting. It's just too much. And like just the ridiculous food they ate and the clothing they wore. Like uh, yeah, the, the people writing about this were just outraged all the time and were uh, talking about like, can you believe this person puts jewels on their feet? This is ridiculous. Um, uh, the, my, my, probably my favorite part was that they were uh, sensibly obsessed with their own death. 
uh, that they made a, a special uh, silk, pur uh, purple and scarlet silk noose. Uh, they didn't want to like have anybody else kill them. They wanted to, to be, take an active hand in their own demise. Um, had multiple gold swords uh, laying around the palace just in case a coup started. Uh, poisons uh, that they put in various sapphires and emeralds and other precious gems and essentially a gilded tower from which to throw themselves so nobody could say that they died in as baller a fashion. Um, so I can absolutely understand why everybody like with latter day want to reclaim uh, this human. But again, this is all just sort of stuff that's supposed to be so outrageous that even like ancient world people weren't really taking this seriously. Like most of the stuff from the Historia Augusta was meant as like just to suck up to later emperors. So literally the entry for Elagabalus comes in before an, em an emperor that we're supposed to like. So the Elagabalus uh, is, like makes the other guy look good. Um, generally speaking, when someone's uh, resume reads like an aristocrat's joke or the protocols of the elders of Zion, you probably shouldn't take it that seriously. Uh, really, what's likely is that this was an unprepared teenager thrust into the spotlight by uh, his family that wanted uh, a greater, greater sense in the spotlight. Uh, was killed four years in, uh, replaced by their cousin, uh, the, the, the grandma who, who put them in power kind of ousted them, got them killed. Uh, soldiers, uh, <laughs> sensibly, uh, they were killed on the toilet uh, and then dragged through the streets, dumped in the, the river. Um, and then this is, is probably more likely, they, they did a Donatio Memoriae, which is where they basically uh, strike them from the historical record, which allows all of these crazy rumors to take place, which were kind of uncritically thought about up to like almost the 1950s. People weren't really, they were just repeating these crazy rumors. And even nowadays, you'll see a lot of articles online and YouTube videos and whatnot about this human being, uh, like bald face saying, oh, this person was like just the, the most opulent, crazy emperor of all time, or this person was an unabashed gay un icon who was misunderstood and like really it's, it's more complicated than that. I think it's a, a fabulous story and a really interesting human being who uh, my read on it is that they were probably like, yeah, like definitely a, a, a queer human at the, the, the very least possibly trans, uh, hard to graph modern ideas of gender onto the past, but it's entirely possible, but really just caught up in and upon in other people's games. And it's kind of a tragic story, honestly. Uh, pops up in popular media later on, uh, including our boy, boy Neil again. Uh, Neil Gaiman did a 24 hour comic in 1992 about uh, Helio Gabalus, uh, which happened to actually uh, deal with all of the gnarly stuff about, uh, about them uh, in a, a critical fashion. But it was 92 and people didn't really know a whole lot. So. Uh, it's fine. Uh, it, it's really a pretty fun comic that you can find for free online anyway. So yeah, uh, that is uh, some wacky, fun, interesting emperors for you. That's what I got for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I didn't talk too fast. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs>